when, uh, when approaching a patient with uh, uh, cardiovascular disease or really any disease type, the first thing you do is establish contact. And usually what I'll do is feel, as you shake their hand, feel the radial pulse. There's not really any information in the radial pulse other than the heart rate. Uh, pulse character is best felt in the carotid or brachial arteries. Uh, after doing so, inspection of the neck veins, and we will have uh, Dr. Paul Woods, who has an incredibly irritating voice, but an incredibly good discussion of inspection of the jugular veins, so we'll look at that. Uh, and inspection of the precordial uh, uh, impulse. There you look for uh, the uh, point of maximal impulse and then feel for it. Uh, the uh, precordial impulse uh, should generally be fourth or fifth intercostal space, midclavicular line. Its movement tells you that chamber enlargement may be present. Uh, its uh, nature may tell you evidence of prior myocardial infarction, and if sustained, meaning that you can feel the apical impulse for more than one-third of systole, it's very good evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. After finding the impulse auscultation, and what we're going to go through today is auscultation of normal and abnormal uh, heart sounds. So first and second sounds, splitting of the second sound, and the, nor the abnormal extraneous sounds that you may hear. Uh, everything that we're going to discuss today uh, is available at this website. You can download all of the heart sounds and heart murmurs uh, in an MP3 uh, or an iPod format. And the more you listen to these things, the easier it is to recognize. I'll kind of go through with you today how to think through the abnormal heart sounds, but uh, it, it does require practice. That's. Uh, so we'll start with Dr. Woods and the inspection of the jugular veins. The jugular pulse consists essentially of four main waves, A, X, V, and Y. A and V being crests, red string high pressure, X and Y being troughs or periods of low pressure. The A wave corresponds to right atrial systole, a fifth positive wave, C, may interrupt the X-descent. The X-descent begins with atrial relaxation and is augmented during the earlier part of ventricular systole by displacement of the floor of the atrioventricular septum towards the apex of the heart, creating a negative pressure within the atria. The venous pressure rises later during ventricular systole to form the V-wave, because at this time, outflow from the atria is temporarily obstructed. The Y descent, or the downslope of V, begins as soon as the tricuspid valve opens, when right atrial and ventricular pressures equalize rapidly and fall together to the trough Y, after which they rise again before the onset of the next atrial contraction. The patient should be placed supine if the pressure is below sternal angle level, or propped up if the pressure is raised the correct position being that which favors maximum jugular pulsation. The most readily inspected pulsation is that of the internal jugular vein. With normal rhythm, there are two main waves, the A wave of atrial systole, the V wave of ventricular systole, and two troughs, X and Y, per cardiac cycle. The movement is soft, diffuse, undulant, and normally impalpable. When timed against the carotid pulse, only the first trough X appears to coincide with systole. The A wave precedes it, the V peak is appreciably later, and Y is clearly diastolic. You can see the arterial pulse here clearly by the light reflection on the red spot. The venous pressure rises on expiration and falls with inspiration, passively following the changes in intrathoracic pressure. The amplitude of all the waves increases during inspiration. Cervical venous pulsation ceases when the jugular veins are compressed at the root of the neck. Light pressure of the finger against the root of the external jugular vein distends the upper part of the vessel. On removing the finger, the vein collapses to the level of the mean jugular venous pressure.
Sir Thomas Lewis pointed out that the most satisfactory reference point from which to measure the venous pressure was the sternal angle, because this was about five centimeters above the center of the right atrium in both horizontal and vertical positions. With reference to the sternal angle, the venous pressure swings around a mean level of about minus two centimeters in the horizontal position, but the range is considerable. Indeed, in this normal subject, the maximum systolic level, which happens to be A, is plus 3.5 centimeters. So the major points there are that you can look at the waveform of the jugular veins. Now, I've seen this thing probably a hundred times, and I still can't look at the reflection from that red spot and tell you what's A and V. But it's, it's very easy at the bedside with your finger on the carotid pulse. The A wave will precede the pulse touching your finger. Or if you're listening at the same time, if you place your stethoscope at the base and listen to the first and second heart sounds, the A wave corresponds to the first heart sound and the V wave, the second heart sound. That makes it a lot easier. It's a lot easier to process the uh, visual and auditory sensation rather than uh, tactile. When you uh, examine the mean right atrial pressure, which is your important number to determine a patient's volume state, if someone's got edema, you look at the mean right atrial pressure, so you look at that external jugular to get an idea what mean right atrial pressure is. You measure it above the sternal angle and add five centimeters to that, five centimeters of water. That tells you the pressure in centimeters of water. Multiply that by 0 0.7 and you get the pressure in millimeters mercury. The normal right atrial pressure is 0 to 5 millimeters mercury. So if the jugular veins are elevated, if the right atrial pressure is high and you've got edema, you know it's cardiac. If the jugular veins are not elevated and there's evidence of edema, you know it's non-cardiac and you look for liver disease or kidney disease or underlying venous disease. So the jugular veins are a very important window and that's the important first step in, uh, in the examination. Now what we're going to listen to are some of the extra heart sounds. We're going to start with a fourth heart sound. But what I'll ask you to do is you listen to these sounds, you'll be able to see the EKG go across the screen. When you do, use that QRS. That QRS is going to be the first heart sound. Use that for your timing and you'll notice that these sounds are going to cluster. They're going to cluster around S1 and S2. An extra sound around S1 is either an S4, split first heart sound, which will vary with ventilation, or the ejection sound of a bicuspid aortic valve. A lot of you probably learned the cadence, you, Tennessee and Kentucky and that sort of stuff. That cadence won't help you differentiate a fourth heart sound from an ejection sound. They're both sounds around S1 with almost exactly the same cadence. So it takes a little bit more information than that. And we'll, we'll talk about it as we get to each heart sound. Sounds around the second sound are a split second sound, which is normal, but there may be variations in that normality. The opening snap of rheumatic mitral stenosis and the filling sound. The filling sound may be tumor plop, pericardial knock, or a failing left ventricle. In a child, it may be a normal uh, diastolic filling sound. And one sound which falls exactly in between S1 and S2 is aptly termed the mid-systolic click of mitral prolapse. So as we listen to these, kind of learn to cluster them. Sounds around S1, sounds around S2. You'll be able to differentiate them based upon where you hear them and what you hear it best with, diaphragm or bell. So we're going to start with a fourth heart sound. You can see we're listening in the uh, fifth interspace, midclavicular line, left lateral decubitus position. So the heart's uh, allowed to passively fall over near the chest wall so we can hear it better. As you watch that QRS appear, you hear the first sound before that QRS appears, telling you that this is before S1. Now you'll probably never hear another fourth heart sound as loud as this, which is why we recorded it. It's usually a, a little more difficult to hear a fourth. It's low frequency, it's very dull, it's heard best with the bell of your stethoscope. And frequently, if you take your stethoscope and press too tightly with the bell, you'll create a diaphragm out of the skin, and the fourth heart sound will be obscured. And you can see, right when you see the P wave appear, you hear this sound. This is a non-compliant left ventricle that doesn't want to take any more blood. 
there's left ventricular hypertrophy or coronary artery disease or hypertrophic myopathy. So it's not particularly happy about accepting blood, but with atrial systole, the ventricle has to stretch a little more and it vibrates, which creates the fourth heart sound. Can be seen in normal adults, though not commonly. If a patient comes in and complains of chest discomfort, you hear this sound, you're pretty good bet that you're dealing with coronary artery disease. Now when you hear these sounds, we're going to hear some sounds which we'll hear up at the base and some sounds we'll hear at the apex. Not everybody reads their textbook to know how to put their sounds in the aortic or mitral positions. So one thing that makes it very easy is an idea or a concept that Dr. Proctor Harvey invented, which is inching. So you start up at the base of the right sternal border, move across to the upper left sternal border and move down the sternum, then out towards the apex. If you do that, you'll be able to orient yourself to S1 and S2, and then extra sounds will be easy to place. Sounds around S1, sounds around S2. Yep. Let's listen to it. Normal splitting of the second sound. You can start at the base, get S1 and S2, get your cadence, and then when the extra sound pops up, you can place it much more easily. Inching is also important because many murmurs will occur outside the location where they're supposed to occur. So now a sound with the exact same cadence as a fourth heart sound. We're going to still listening at the apex, left lateral decubitus position. You'll note the cadence is very similar, but it's a high frequency sound. And if you watch the QRS, the extra sound occurs after the QRS. Fourth heart sound was dull, low frequency. This is very discreet. It's going to be heard best with the diaphragm. And it really may be heard anywhere along left ventricular outflow tracks. So anywhere apex as you move up towards the base, you can hear an ejection sound. Now here we have the luxury of having a QRS. At the bedside, you don't have that. So you've got two tools. One is to take the bell and press it against the skin, making the skin into a diaphragm. An ejection sound will get louder as you do that. A fourth heart sound will go away. The second thing is you can place your finger on the carotid pulse. Fourth heart sound and a first heart sound will come and go before you feel the pulse. The ejection sound you'll hear at exactly the same time as the pulse touches your finger. Now these ejection sounds are usually due to dysmorphic valves, though pulmonary ejection sounds can have other causes and even an aortic ejection sound not always has to be due to dysmorphic valve but most commonly so. And what happens with a normal uh, three leaflet valve is that it can fold at these area called the nodules of Arante. So the valve can fold back creating this kind of six-sided structure that very closely approximates the area of a circle. With a bicuspid valve, the valve tissue can't fold back out of the way so it stays in the flow stream. So it goes from a place at rest, then during peak ejection it's thrust upward and then ceases its excursion which creates the high frequency sound that we hear. And we can hear the same thing from the pulmonary valve, though with pulmonary artery hypertension or a dilated pulmonary artery, we can have an ejection sound without valvular disease. Now, this guy's got a very loud murmur. Now, I'll let you listen to it one cycle around and see if you can pick up the ejection sound. Anybody hear it? If you listen to the way the murmur begins and watch his ventilation, when he's exhaled, the murmur's going to start with almost a pow, pow. 
when he inhales, the murmur just kind of groans into existence. <clears throat> Starts with a pow. The pow goes away. So you really notice it by its absence. Now this guy's murmur is pan-systolic, so his pulmonary valve stenosis is pretty severe. More milder forms, it's easier to hear the ejection sound. But if you'll notice, when he takes a breath in, the ejection sound gets quieter. It's the only right-sided event that's diminished by ventilatory effort. So what's happening is, you take a breath in, you fill your right ventricle from the systemic veins and the pressure starts to rise. The pulmonary artery is at normal pressure, so the valve begins to open in diastole. So you start right ventricular systole, the valve's already open, so it doesn't have to cease its excursion. Whereas you exhale, the valve's at rest, then right ventricular systole begins, thrust the valve open, and when it ceases its motion, we get the ejection sound. Many patients with pulmonary valve stenosis have very severe uh, PS before they develop any symptoms, and it's mostly exertional fatigue, rarely right-sided failure symptoms. Now, that sounds around us when I didn't show you a split first heart sound, but the S4 and the ejection sound. Now we're going to move in between S1 and S2, and you'll be able to tell as soon as I turn this on, it's aptly termed. Da, 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 da. Sounds like dance steps. We're again listening at the apex. It's heard best with the diaphragm. Now this mid-systolic click is usually due to something called mitral prolapse, often due to myxomatous degeneration of the mitral valve. And what happens is the mitral valve leaflets essentially get too long for the ventricular chamber. So as ventricular systole begins and the volume of the ventricle shrinks, the valve can no longer be held in place and it slips. When it slips and stops again, we get the click. Since it's a ratio between mitral leaflet or mitral structure length and left ventricular volume, that's something we can manipulate. So we can change the timing of when the click occurs. That's very important diagnostically. So how do you change ventricular volume? You can have a patient stand up or squat down, or have them do valsalva maneuver or amyl nitrate. What we'll look at first is a valsalva maneuver. During the strain phase, you diminish systemic venous return and eventually shrink left ventricular volume. So if you're starting at a smaller volume, the prolapse or the slip will occur more early. So when she starts her valsalva, note the change in when that a click occurs. multiple clicks. Then right next to S1, almost like the ejection sound was. And she releases. It's right back out there. So you can slide this click up and down. So you hear an extra sound and you say, well, I think this is a mid-systolic click. I think it's mitral prolapse. You put through maneuvers and you can prove it. Now, I find it hard to get a patient to do a valsalva. They want to try so hard to please you that they'll strain so hard, all you can hear is muscle tremor. What I find is a little bit easier is standing and squatting. You can sit down on a chair in front of the patient. They can squat down and stand up in front of you while you listen to the heart. When you squat down, you're going to return venous blood to the heart, and the heart's volume increases. The click gets lighter. When you stand up, you leave about 600 cc's of blood in your feet, so ventricular volume shrinks. So we'll listen to her click as she squats and stands. Very difficult to appreciate. It's right next to the first heart sound. It's all day until you hear that click. Step outside, smoke a cigarette, and still hear the click. And when she stands up, it's going to slide back to X1, next to S1.
brief mid-systolic murmur that's probably an intracavitary gradient. Your stethoscope is more accurate at making the diagnosis of mitral prolapse than an echo. The echo is limited in the windows that it can look at the mitral valve. Your stethoscope can hear every part of that leaflet tissue. And remember that if you, send, if you think you hear a mid-systolic click, you put them through maneuvers, you send them for the echo, remember they're going to do the echo lying down left lateral decubitus position. So whereas you may be able to elicit prolapse in the clinic while you're listening to the patient standing, unless they put a patient through maneuvers while they're doing the echo, they may not realize that prolapse is present. So now we'll move down to sounds around S2. The first sound around S2 that's important is normal splitting of the second heart sound. If you'll watch his ventilatory excursion, when he takes a breath in, the second heart sounds dirty. It's reduplicated. As he exhales, it becomes more single again. So kind of watch his ventilatory effort and listen to the second sound. Split. Goes single. Splits. So as you breathe and change right ventricular volume, you change right ventricular ejection time. You got more blood in the right ventricle, takes longer to empty, pulmonary valve closure occurs later. So that's normal or physiologic splitting of the second heart sound. Can any, anybody tell me what this is? Soft, undulant, generally impalpable. Which wave is this? It's occurring at the same time you hear the first heart sound. Yeah, so that's a normal jugular venous A wave. So you can see how easy this is to do on a skinny patient. Some of your heavier patients you may not be able to really see. Okay, this fellow with a nosebleed has a right bundle branch block and wide splitting of his second sound. Wide splitting means no matter whether he's inhaling or exhaling, you can still hear splitting of the second sound. There's no phase at which you don't hear splitting. Hear him breathe right there, the splitting gets really wide. Then it narrows back down a little bit, but you can always hear the second sound split. The most common cause of wide splitting with physiologic variation is right bundle branch block but it may also be pulmonary artery hypertension, pulmonary valve stenosis, right ventricular failure. This fellow is always split, but as you watch his ventilation, there's no change in the character of the splitting. So whether he breathes in or out, second sound sounds the same. And you'll notice if you look at this transducer, you see how it's thrust upward with each systole. And in mid-systole, there's, there's a real short mid-systolic murmur. Wide, fixed splitting of the second heart sound is always an atrial septal defect. What's happening is, as you take a breath in, you accentuate uh, uh, systemic venous return to the right ventricle. You exhale, you accentuate pulmonary venous return, and it goes across to the right ventricle. So whether you're inhaling or exhaling, the right ventricle gets the same amount of blood. And it is never normal to have a visible or a palpable impulse along the left sternal border. So that's evidence of an enlarged right ventricle that's imparting more force. The mid-systolic murmur, palpable right ventricular impulse, and fixed splitting all give you the diagnosis of an ASD.
This one's a little bit harder. You're going to have to listen to him breathe in the background at the same time you're paying attention to the second sound. When he exhales, you hear splitting. And you'll hear him in the background. This guy breathes really loud. When he takes a breath in, the second sound will come together and sound single again. Here it's split. Single. And you can hear him in the background breathing. When you're always split but you go single when you inhale, that's paradoxical because the opposite of normal. That's usually due to a left bundle branch block, but it may be due to hypertension, left ventricular failure, aortic valve stenosis. In fact, one of the more common uh, places that I see it is these little old ladies with severe systolic hypertension. And that's paradoxical splitting that you can put a nitroglycerin underneath the tongue and the splitting will melt away while you're listening to them. They'll go back to normal as you lessen their systolic blood pressure. Now, rheumatic mitral disease, splitting of the second sound, the mid-systolic click, this is all things that are high frequency. We're going to be hearing those best with the diaphragm. The opening snap is the same way. It's the diastolic filling sound, if you will, that's heard best with the diaphragm. And it's farther away from the second heart sound, so you can distinguish it from splitting. You can tell there's a lot of distance between them. You'll be able to hear that. And it's heard best just inside the apical impulse. Not on the apical impulse, because we're going to hear that there's a murmur that's going to obscure the opening snap. Pay attention to the QRS, because your brain wants everything to be in systole. So if you watch that QRS, you're going to hear the murmur go, oh, and stop right when the QRS appears. So low frequency, grumbling murmur. Initiating the murmur is an opening snap. But it's hard to pay attention to the opening snap because the murmur grabs your attention so quickly. So if you move just inside the apical impulse, patient's still in the left lateral decubitus position. So we move inside the apical impulse and listen with the diaphragm. You can still hear a little presystolic murmur. Whoop, whoop, da da, whoop, da da. What rheumatic disease does is causes inflammation of the submitral apparatus and the tips of the leaflets so that as it heals, the leaflets essentially get sewn together. The bases of the leaflets can still move. So as the left ventricle relaxes, pressure falls, the mitral valve is thrust open, and then it ceases its excursion, we get the opening snap. So let's listen to another example of it this case a little bit more severe mitral stenosis. Patient's a little more tachycardic. We still have that decrescendo crescendo murmur in diastole. And we'll move inside the apex Da, 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 da. You can tell this one's a little softer than the first one we listened to. As patients age and as the disease gets worse, the, the uh, leaflets and the inflamed structures calcify, so they move less. The less they move, the softer the opening snap gets. You can also tell this one's a lot closer to the second heart sound. Sounds almost like that fixed split we were listening to. But we're not listening at the base, we're listening just inside the apex. 
and it's something important, I'll show you an example, but is your heart's going to keep a normal cardiac output at all costs until late stage disease. In order to do that with rheumatic mitral disease, what you've got to do is raise your left atrial pressure to push that same amount of blood across the valve. As the pressure rises, we're going to thrust the mitral valve open earlier. That means the opening snap then is going to get closer and closer to the second heart sound. That's called the A2OS interval. So the worse disease, the shorter the A2OS. Let's, let's go listen to an example. So this is a simulator. Now, if with a little bit of practice, you can time many of the event, events of the heart with your ear and say they're 50, 75, or 100 milliseconds apart. But let's just listen to this simulator. This is 75 milliseconds between the second sound and the simulated opening snap. Just to give you a, a base, very tight splitting where you begin to hear splitting of the second heart sound, 25 milliseconds. Wide splitting, 40 to 50 milliseconds. So this is 75. It's all day long. Now let's listen to moderate uh, mitral valve stenosis. And then severe. One of my old teachers was amazingly accurate at determining these intervals, but the older guys really had to depend on their stethoscope to make a diagnosis to decide when to refer somebody for, for surgery at a time prior to the advent of modern diagnostic techniques. So I'm not expecting you to go out of here and say, well, this is moderate mitral valve stenosis. But to know that the A2OS interval does allow you some insight into the severity of uh, rheumatic disease or rheumatic mitral disease. Now then, moving out a little bit further, close to 100, 110 milliseconds, this is going to be a much duller quality sound, heard best with a bell, also apex left lateral decubitus position. It's a third heart sound, which in adults is always pathological, always. In children, it may be normal, because in children, the very elastic heart, as it uncoils, it thrusts itself into the chest wall, creating a sound. Now, if you're vigorously active, like performance athletes, you may keep that third heart sound into young adulthood, you know, mid to late 20s. But in the age range of the peop most of the people you're going to be seeing, a third heart sound is always pathological. This is the old Milwaukee of third heart sounds. You will never hear another one this loud. So extra sound around S2 heard with a bell at the apex, which tells you it's a filling sound. Now, in a patient who comes in with symptoms of dyspnea, perhaps prior myocardial infarction, you say, ah, this is the filling sound of left ventricular failure. It usually means a dilated hypocontractile heart. You can manipulate third heart sounds. You'll notice, listen to the loudness of the third heart sound, and then note after the PVC occurs what happens to it. It had almost gone away. It was getting hard to hear, and then you hear the PVC, and bang, it's coming back with a vengeance. If you think you hear a third heart sound, remember you've got to have the patient left lateral decubitus supine to hear a third heart sound. They're usually very soft. Semi-recumbent in the Bentop emergency room is not the way to hear a third heart sound. You know, listening in a zoo it may be obscured by the other noise around. If you think you hear one but you're not sure, what you can do is hold the patient's legs, have them do 10 sit-ups. In the United States, that's considered significant exertion. Or what I'll do in the clinic is have them walk down the hallway and come back and lay back down. That will accentuate the third heart sound, so if you think you hear it, 
it should be loud enough then so that you can be sure. Now, let's listen to a more typical example. Comes and goes. Kind of a squeaky systolic murmur. There it is. Fades away and comes back. This is a bit more typical of what you're going to be hearing. And you'll notice we're listening over here in the axilla. So we're listening over his apex. His apex belongs up here. So clearly, some of his chambers, something is very dilated, shifting his apical impulse. Yeah? He's breathing. Yeah, these low frequency sounds actually carry a lot of energy but it's the, the frequency of a third and most fourth heart sounds is around 30 to 40 hertz. That's the limits of human hearing. So any attenuation at all, and you're going to have a very hard time hearing it. Your, your ear is attuned to the human voice, about five to 600 hertz. So anything outside that range has to be a hell of a lot louder for you to hear it. So although it carries a lot of energy and it has the same, uh, uh, same energy as many of the murmurs we're going to hear, a lot harder to hear because it's just at the limits of what you can hear. You attenuate it just a little bit and it's gone. That's why you have to listen left lateral decubitus position with a bell placed very lightly against the skin. That bell is going to filter out higher frequency sounds that might obscure the third heart sound. And what a third heart sound is, I'll kind of show you this example. This is uh, a Doppler across the mitral valve, and it's showing you how fast blood comes in. So this mitral valve opens. The blood comes in very fast, but is very quickly then the ventricle says, nope, no more, and flow stops. So it's a ventricle that can't accept any more blood. It's a failing ventricle. The fourth heart sound is the sound of atrial success, thrusting blood into the ventricle. The third heart sound, the sound of ventricular failure. Now another filling sound that does sound a little bit different from an S3, but more useful are the other clinical findings to allow you to make the diagnosis is that a pericardial knock. Now it doesn't, it doesn't sound like a knock, it sounds like a filling sound. Its frequency is a little higher so you can hear it with the diaphragm and the bell equally loud, and you can generally hear it throughout the precordium. But what's most important is who you hear it in, the history that goes along with the physical diagnosis. You're going to notice this guy's got a median sternotomy scar, and I'll ask you to watch his precordium during systole, and you notice he's got proximal muscle wasting. We'll look at some of the other findings in just a minute, but first let's listen to it. Bum, ba bum, bum, ba bum. You'll notice his chest wall moves in during systole. We're listening at lower left sternal border. Now let's move out. I can hear it equally well. I can watch his chest wall move in. Now you might say, hey, that sounds a lot like that mitral opening snap. And it does. Sounds a lot like the opening snap of that moderate mitral valve stenosis. But there's no murmur at the apex. That opening snap we heard just inside the apical impulse, not at the left sternal border. So we really heard this throughout the precordium. And what's probably the most useful thing is the neck veins. Watch along this shadow, you'll be able to see what his jugular venous pulse does. And at the same time you hear the opening snap, it's going to look like somebody reached up and yanked the jugular veins flat, which is the rapid Y descent of constrictive pericarditis.
Outside the United States, the most common cause is tuberculous pericarditis. Inside the, most, inside the U.S., the most common cause is us. Uh, sending someone for cardiac surgery can occur after idiopathic pericarditis, uh, bacterial, uh, or with uh, rheumatic diseases and uh, uremic pericarditis as well. What's happening is the, the pericardium, which normally can accommodate lots of extra room, has become rigid and shrunk slightly. So now when the ventricle tries to fill, it fills to its maximal volume, but then it encounters the pericardium. The pericardium says, no, no more. And it vibrates, creating the pericardial knock. Symptoms are generally those of right ventricular failure. So you have volume overload, edema, a lot of times ascites disproportionate to the edema. They'll generally have chronic atrial fibrillation, and they're many times symptomatic for three to five years before the diagnosis is established. So thus the proximal muscle wasting. The pericardium, because it's rigid, snaps back very quickly. So the ventricle squeezes, and it's adherent to the chest wall, which allows you to see the intercostal retraction that we saw. Then in diastole, everything retracts. The rigid pericardium snaps back to its shape, which that rapid fall in ventricular pressure then creates the rapid wide descent. So it's the constellation of findings that allows you to say, this is a pericardial knock. You don't listen to it and say, hmm, that's a knocking quality sound. This must be per constrictive pericarditis. The history the median sternotomy, the precordial retraction, the jugular veins, all allow you to assign uh, the diagnosis of pericardial knock. That's, we'll listen to the knock. And the moderate mitral stenosis. Knock is a little bit lighter than the opening snap. And with the mitral stenosis, we've got the murmur. Whoop da da, whoop da da. Now, not all constriction will have a pericardial knock, particularly if it's rapid and onset, like some forms of inflammatory pericarditis. Another filling sound that's very similar to mitral stenosis is that of left atrial myxoma. Uh, myxomas are often attached to the uh, uh, fossa ovalis, or the interatrial septum, and when they become very large, they're gelatinous and mobile, so that during peak ventricular filling, the tumor can essentially lay over the mitral valve orifice, stopping ventricular filling. When it does so, it creates a sound. First heart sounds loud. There's presystolic murmur. Whoop da da, whoop da da, whoop da da. You hear that filling sound? It occurs a little earlier than the third heart sound did. But it's exactly like mitral stenosis with one exception. You're, this is loudest with a bell. So we hear a little bit of murmur, but not much. Let's move inside the apical impulse. no real change. So S3 to Sandoran S2, it's a little bit further away than these guys. It's heard with a bell, generally soft and at the apex. Opening snap, heard best with the diaphragm inside the apex, carries a murmur with it. Pericardial knock, carries tons of baggage, diaphragm and bell equal, generally throughout the precordium. And then a tumor plop, heard best with a bell, usually a little presystolic murmur. Now these patients will present with dyspnea, they may have fever of uncertain origin, embolic phenomena, slightly more common in women. We'll listen to the tumor plop. And you note the no low frequency of the sound, it's kind of a thump. Now let's listen to the opening snap. higher frequency, more discreet. 
and that hits us for heart sounds. Next week what we'll do are the common murmurs.